Good morning. Good morning. It is so good to be back. I was say back in the world. I think it's better to be back together, to actually see each other face to face, even with the restrictions in place. It was so good to have you here today. I'm going to say hello as well, just at this point, to those who will join us later um, on YouTube, watching the recording of the service. We're so conscious that we may be separated by time and space, but as has been the whole way through this pandemic, we are united in Christ and in our hearts and our praise and our worship of Him. I want to just very briefly this morning thank those people who have worked so hard in order to get the church ready for meeting together again, those who have been cleaning and setting up and measuring and marking out and helping us to implement the government guidelines to ensure that we're all as safe as possible. So thank you for all your help and preparing for that. That includes those of you who have followed that guidance with us. And we've been really encouraged by the response um, for people to come. It's going to be a little bit of working out of how people can, can participate with the two leaders. So it'll probably take us a few weeks to reach our key number or our sweet spot, so to speak. And so please do be patient with us as that we're making these decisions so that we can avoid overcrowding as best as possible. We're sorry for those of you who weren't able to join us today. Uh, but if you would like to join us next week for worship, we'd simply ask that you contact John or myself from tomorrow morning through to Thursday to reserve your place so that we can have a, an idea of how many people will be there. That helps us with contact tracing and it also helps us to plan how many people we can accommodate in the building. We're also aware that many people still don't be ready to come back for a whole variety of reasons. I want you to know that's okay. Come back and be comfortable and ready and the recordings will continue to go out for the foreseeable future. You'll likely have seen in the news over this last week that the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, along with other major churches across Ireland, are now recommending and encouraging the use of face coverings in all church settings. So we would ask in compliance with that that you would please wear a face covering unless medically exempt or under 13 to help with that. The, the guidance seems to be suggesting that it's another way mitigate the spread of the virus. Just quickly a few practical things about this morning and then we will come to worship. Just ask you to stay in your seat um, if possible um, to help us maintain social distancing. If you do need to leave for any reason, do use this door at the side to help us keep a one-way flow. And if you require the toilet, the only toilet facilities we have present will be the disabled toilet at the front of the church hall. So again you can leave through the door here and go to that. And then at the end of our service this morning, we'd ask that you remain in your seat until a steward can indicate that it's safe and clear for you to leave. But we have come here this morning to worship God. So let us do that. Let us hear God's word as we read together from Psalm 1. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. We have come this morning to meditate on God's word, to delight in his words, so that we might experience that blessing that flows from it. We're going to join our hearts together and sing praise together as we sing our opening praise. Psalm 1. We're going to remain seated for the singing of this praise. There's no hymn books, but the words will be on the screen. Let's join together to sing Psalm 1.
Let us join our hearts together and continue to worship God as we pray together, bringing our prayers of adoration and confession before Him. Let us pray. Our great God, we come before you this morning and we approach you with joy and with praise. We are glad to come once again to your house. We are glad to gather with brothers and sisters for fellowship and worship. Your word tells us that when we gather together, we should spur each other on to love and good deeds. And so, Father, we pray that as we meet together, we would encourage each other. We praise you, Lord, for as we had just been saying, you are our good shepherd. We are the sheep of your flock. So gently and tenderly you have led us and guided us. We give thanks because you are a dependable God. You do not let us down. We give thanks, Lord, for how you have already journeyed with us already this year through many unexpected twists and turns. We can truly say that you did not abandon us in the darkest hour. We give thanks, Lord, for Jesus, the good shepherd of our souls today. Conscious that we can really only come and worship you today. Because he first laid down his life for us. Father, we rejoice that in and through his death, he has given us life in all its fullness. True life. Eternal life. Father, as we rejoice in your care and provision for us. And in your protection for us. We must also confess that we have not always followed you closely, but all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one of us to our own way. We have ignored your warnings and become distracted by the things of this world, and so wandered away from you. Father, forgive us. Draw us back in to the tender embrace of our good shepherd. All this we ask in his name. Amen. We're going to read the scriptures together. Um, we have sat to sing. Uh, I'm going to ask you if you're able to stand as we read the scriptures together. In many reformed traditions around the world, we stand together for reading of God's word as a sign of honour. So I'm going to ask you if you're able this time to stand together. We're going to read Luke chapter 6. So please stand for reading. One of those days, Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray, and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him, and chose twelve of them, whom he had designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother, Andrew, James, John, and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by the impure spirits were cured. And the people tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil, because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is now their ancestors treated their problems. But woe to you who are rich, for you already have received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn me. Woe to everyone. But woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Amen. We pray God bless the reading of his word to us. You may be seated. We're well, going to have a children's address for the children aren't going to come to the front. So if you stay in the pews with your parents, we'll give you a wave to let me know where you are so I can see you. So I can talk to you. That would be really helpful. Good. Good. How are we doing? Give me a thumbs up. See if we can see that with my glasses. Thumbs up for good. Thumbs down if you're not so good. Somewhere in the middle. Good. Let me know. Are you going back to school? 
Yes, good. We're back. So thumbs up or side for school, thumbs down or maybe somewhere in the middle. Good. Lots of thumbs up, lots of really keen people in first reward if you have back to school. Well, if you go back to school, I hope you've got your school bag packed, all your school bag packed. Yes. Yes, brilliant. School bag packed. And you should have done all your preparations. You should have, let's see what we've got in here. Have you been out and got your school uniform? Yeah, I thought you had to get a new school uniform, or you had not room very much. Yeah, do you have new school shoes? Good. Um, a lunchbox, very right, important to get a lunchbox so that you're able to stay well fed, you don't get too hungry when the day comes. You need a five, maybe not so much if you're in primary school, but you need a five to keep all your work in. And you'll need a pencil case to keep all your pens and stuff. Make sure everything's labeled on it, isn't that right? It's going to be very important. And then you're going to need the essential item of 2020, your hand sanitizer. Now you might quite need that sort of size of one play, but all of those things you need to prepare to pack, to get back to school nice and safely. This morning, if you were listening to our Bible reading, we heard about some others who were back to school. Because we read about Jesus and his disciples. And a disciple is another word for a pupil or a learner. And Jesus was like their teacher. You see, 2,000 years ago, you didn't go to school. Your teacher just walked around, and if they liked the look at you, they'd say, you can be in my class, you can be in my class, and you can be in my class. And then you would follow them around every day, and you'd watch what they do, you'd eat with them, you'd go to wherever they stayed, you go visit the families and watch your day. Did you hear a funny thing? Would you like to do that? Would you like to follow your teacher around all day and go home with them and eat with them? And mm, that's less keen on going to school. That might be a step too far. But Jesus' disciples followed him around so they could listen to him and learn from him and know what to do. And you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus wants us to be his disciples as well. He wants us to be pupils in his school, if you like. But we don't need a uniform to go to Jesus' school. Because why do you wear a school uniform? Well, you might wear it to go get your other clothes dirty. But you also wear it because it's got a badge on it, doesn't it? It's got a badge that tells people what school you go to. It identifies what school you go to. But Jesus says you don't need a uniform to go to his school. Because people will know that you're a pupil in his school. That's important. By the way, we love each other. He says, people will know you're my disciples. People will know you're my followers. By the way, you show love for each other. By the way, you treat each other. So the uniform we wear in Jesus' school is love. And while you might need lots of books in school, Jesus says, in my school, you'll need one book. The only book you need to learn from is the Bible in Jesus' school. Because the Bible tells us all about Jesus' great love for us and how he wants us to live. But tell me this, in school, does your teacher just talk all day? No. Your teacher will tell you some things, and then she'll ask you to do it, but she'll ask you to practice it, to put it in to practice. And that's what Jesus wants us to do too. He wants us to learn from his word, but not just to listen to it. He actually wants us to try it out, to put it in practice, to do it each week. So, at the start of the term, as you're getting ready to go back to school with your lunchbox and your pencil case and your hand sanitizer and everything else, I want you to think about being a pupil in Jesus school as well. When you put your uniform on in the morning, remember to put on that Jesus uniform of love to others. Maybe start with love for your mommy and daddy and your brothers and sisters, how you talk to them, treat them, and let that go on through the day. But also remember that you learn lots of things in school. You want to learn from God's word as well how to honour and obey Jesus. Let's pray and ask for his help to do that this way. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you care for us. We pray that you'll be with the boys and girls this week as they go back to school. We pray that they will be very conscious that as they go, you go with them. Father, we pray that you will help them to learn lots to have lots of fun in their classes once again. But Lord, your word tells us that wisdom begins with honouring and obeying you. So we ask that you would help each of them early in life to know and love 
and serve you. May we each wear the uniform of love this week and share Jesus' word in our deeds and in the things we say. And his name we pray. Amen. I'm sure you've already gathered there's been lots of changes to how we worship. And one of the, the big changes is that we're not being able to pass an offering plate around for quite some time for very obvious reasons that we can appreciate. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the congregation for the very generous and creative ways that you have managed to maintain your giving over the period of lockdown. I know the church session you've been greatly encouraged and blessed by that. While we want to pass an offering plate around, we do appreciate that offering is a huge part of our liturgy within our reform tradition. Offering of our finances and offering of ourselves for service. So there will be plates at the doors. If you've got your new offering envelopes, you can put them in the plates at the door as you exit. Um, or if you have been given by check or standing order, um, ask if you'd like to continue doing it. If you find that it's been a good rhythm over the period of lockdown, then please feel free to continue to give in that way as well. In a few moments we're going to come and consider God's word together. But as we prepare our hearts to hear from God's word, we're going to spend some time just listening to and reflecting to a piece of music as Tom plays it for us. And then we'll come and consider God's word together. <coughs> Read about Jesus 
for our wonderful time. So we want that passage open before you, um, if you've brought your Bible with you. Well, in verses 12 to 16, we read about these group of traveling companions who Jesus has selected. They're called disciples. We talk a lot in church. If you've grown up in or around the church, I'm sure you'll have heard about the group called the 12 disciples. Even if you're not that familiar with church life, you'll know about the 12 disciples. You'll learn about it in primary school. In church, we talk about discipleship as something we do in the local church. But I wonder if you've ever stopped and asked yourself the question, what exactly does it mean to be a disciple? What exactly is a disciple? How would you answer that question this morning, I wonder? We're going to take some time to think about that just now. In the first century, as we talked to the boys and girls about, disciples were essentially followers or adherents to a certain rabbi's teaching. In the absence of formal education, rabbis would go around and select promising young men, all of them, men who he could train up, who he could teach the important truths of fertility, and who he could show how to live a godly life. One of the challenges that faces us today, I guess, as we think about what it means to follow Jesus and what it means to be a disciple, is all that talk of learning comes from, at least in my mind, an idea of something that's very academic. That to be a disciple is to be in books, it's to learn. That discipleship is about learning and knowledge and books. And that can make us think that following Jesus is a very academic thing. Something we just do with our minds. But while it is to do with our minds and learning things, that's only part of it. I'm sure that boys and girls in church this morning could tell us that schools don't really work like that anymore. Like what I heard, teachers don't just lecture all day from the front of the room. The new North American curriculum introduced something called play-based learning, where children learn as they play, they experiment, and they find out. Educational theorists would tell us that we learn best by doing. And in one sense, that's not really a, a new innovation. It's been touted in educational theory for a long time as revolutionary that we learn best by doing. But anyone who's ever tried to teach someone to build a wall or wire a plug will know that the most effective way of teaching them and training them is not to take them into a room with a desk and a chair and a book on how to wire a plug, but to show them, to watch them do it, to help them. In fact, when lots of people leave school, they'll go out to do apprenticeships, won't they? They'll join apprenticeships, they'll learn these skills, not in the classroom, but on the job, learning as they go. And the New Testament idea of a rabbi and a disciple was in many ways much more like our new curriculum. The concept of a apprenticeship is much closer to the public idea of discipleship than a book where we knows lots of facts. Disciples followed their rabbi around. They listened to their teaching, but they also watched what he did, watched how he interacted with others, how he spoke to others, how he treated others. You see, following Jesus is not purely an academic thing. It's not just about knowing all of the right stuff. It's got a deeply practical element to it as well. As followers of Jesus, we too learn best by doing, by putting what we learn from the Bible into action. Perhaps that's why in verse 12, Jesus also refers to his disciples as apostles. He says we've got disciples and apostles, two words to describe the same group. Apostle literally means sent out ones. Jesus was bringing his disciples in to watch his life, to learn from them, so that he could send them out as sent ones, as servants into the world to serve him and each other. The same is true for us today if we are followers of Jesus. If we are to be his apprentices, then we come to church and we gather on YouTube to watch and listen and learn from him. That is so important. We study his word and his deeds. But it's not just to grow in knowledge, not just to know lots of things, but we do so that, so that when we leave and scatter into our communities and put what we have learned, what we know, into practice. We gather for worship and teaching, but we then scatter in mission and service to the world. That's what it means to be a disciple, to be an apprentice of Jesus. But who were these 
disciples. Well, a few weeks ago, when we looked at the list of names and the genealogy at the end of book three, I said that we would be tempted when we get the long list of names in the Bible to just scan a little bit. We want to be able to list of names. How can that be important? And I said it would be a mistake to do it in book three, and I think it well it would be a mistake to do it in verses 13 to 16. Because this list of names has a lot to teach us about what it means for us to be apprentices of Jesus today, what it means for us to be the church. As I said earlier, Rabbi is usually selected promising young men the cream of the crop, if you like. They would select followers who share common interests with them, who are of a certain social status, so they can gather the best class. But if we look at Jesus' disciples and we read down the list, we see that they're mostly ordinary men. Most of them were by the standards of the day, likely quite uneducated. And the fact that these were all just ordinary men, none of them stand out as being exceptional in their spheres. In fact, the eyes of those around them, they probably appeared quite weak. They were weak in the eyes of those watching them. But in the hands of God, by the Spirit's power, these ordinary Galileans turned the world upside down with the revolutionary message just read the book of Acts and see the change of these 12 ordinary, uneducated ramblers from a tiny little rural place in the Middle East, made with God's Spirit that we've been working with them. Here in these little verses, we have a reminder that Jesus equips those he calls. He gives gifts for his service. Even though in the eyes of the world, maybe even though in our own eyes, we feel weak and ordinary. And an adequate maybe even. Jesus' disciples teach us that in his hands and by his spirit, he empowers us to accomplish great things for him. So we read through these names of the disciples as well. We're also notice the diversity of the disciple. Look down the list, there was Matthew, who we found out a few weeks ago, was a tax collector, someone who worked for the governing and Roman authorities. There was a, a former zealot, the zealots were kind of a political revolutionary group who were often plotting and planning uprisings against the government. So here you've got a former government official and a revolutionary. There were those who had gentle personalities and those who were much more forthright with their opinion. There were some who would have been revered for their deep and sincere faith, while others, like Thomas, we know, really struggled, have opened doubts that they were there with. A real mixed bag of people together. This simple list of names in Luke chapter 6 verses 14 to 16 is a powerful reminder to us of the diversity that exists within the local church. God calls and gathers together people from different social backgrounds and different temperaments and even opposing worldviews that through faith in Jesus he might unite them into one family, one body. God brings us together in our diversity. Our diversity of gifts and talents and even personalities. So that we can work together for the benefit of his kingdom and the blessing of his world. We are all different because we need to be different. Because we have different things that we can all bring. I love what Ray Orkin writes about the diversity of the local church. He says Jesus gets us making friends with people who don't look like us. Then together we become living proof that he really is the Prince of Peace. Jesus gets us making friends with people who don't look like us. Then together we become living proof that he really is the Prince of Peace. And it's only the grace and the gospel of Jesus that could bring such a diverse group of people together and form them into one unified body. This is the beauty of the local church. The final thing I'd like us to notice this morning is the instructions that Jesus gives to his fellow travelers. To this diverse group of followers, what is the content of the training that Jesus offers to his apprentices? The rest of chapter 6 from verse 20 down to 49 is the sermon that Jesus gave to those first apprentices, teaching them what it means to follow him. This morning we're going to briefly consider the opening part of the sermon and then over the next two weeks we're going to look at some more aspects of it. But if you've got your Bible there, you look down to verse 20 to 26, 
you'll notice that these verses are made split into two groups, into Beatitudes and Woes. Jesus is contrasting two ways to live, two goals to pursue. This was a common feature in Old Testament teaching, especially in books like Deuteronomy. So Jesus is using a teaching style that would be very familiar to his disciples. But it's not really something that we're familiar with today. Blessings and woes mean little to us in the West. And in fact, even that word woe can conjure up ideas of threats. Maybe you've heard someone say something like, woe betide you cross me. But the actual word translated woe here is much more compassionate. It's not a threat, it's more of an expression of regret. The New English Bible translates it as alas. The Good News Bible translates it as how terrible. It's got the sense of, oh, I wish they really hadn't done that. Or how much better could this have been had they not done that? It's the feeling of watching someone do something foolish but being powerless to stop them. Tom Wright explains that here Jesus is giving his followers his apprentices clear orders as to how his vision of God's work would go forward. To show them how this work would go forward, he gives them four promises and four warnings. One of the issues we face in looking at these promises and warnings is that they don't seem to make much sense to our Western mindsets, do they? Everything that Jesus says seems to go against everything we're taught by popular culture. Because Jesus says that it's the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the excluded who will be blessed, while the rich and the comfortable will be in danger. We look around in our world, we're tempted to think, well, that's not how things are. We need to remember is that what Jesus is teaching in these promises and warnings is that those who are poor and hungry and excluded are blessed. They're blessed because they'll never be tempted to rely on their wealth or on themselves. Because in reality they've got nothing to rely on. While wealth often leads us to trust in ourselves, to forget our need for Jesus. Comment and boom, the Holocaust survivor poignantly puts it. You may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. You may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Jesus makes the same point in other places where he warns about how it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Or whenever he tells the parable of the sower and he warns that it's the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires of other things that will come in and choke the word and make it unfruitful. At the core of these promises and warnings, these two ways to live, Jesus is teaching his disciples to live for what really matters. He says, don't live for the temporary happiness that comes with wealth and the praise and the power of people. Don't live for the happiness that you can experience here and now that will go away. But pursue a life towards a heavenly reward that will have eternal joy. Followers of Jesus are to live with eyes fixed in eternity, not the here and now. We can endure the struggles of this life. We can persevere through the twists and the turns of this life through following Jesus. With eyes fixed not on temporary reprieves here and now, but on that day of rejoicing when we will receive an eternal reward that can't be stolen, that won't rust, that will never be taken away. So what does this passage have to teach us about being apprentices of Jesus today? Let me leave you with three quick, practical things. First of all, it teaches us that following Jesus is about more than just having knowledge. It's about apprenticeship. Putting into action what we read and study in God's Word. As James would say, it's about being doers of the Word as well as hearers of it. And that's a vital balance that we must get as followers of Jesus. Learn from His Word and put it into action in our daily lives as we seek to serve Him wherever he is called and placed us. The second thing we see is that Jesus often chooses the weak to display his strength. Often we feel that we can't serve God in different spheres and in different ways, in different places. But if the first followers of Jesus teach us anything, 
It is that God's Spirit transforms ordinary men and women into powerful agents of transformation. We need to trust that God will gift and equip us for the places He calls us to go and then faithfully obey, obey that call. The final thing I want us to say is that following Jesus will probably mean going against the grain of this world. It will probably mean living in a way that looks foolish. Living in a way that seems upside down, but knowing deep down that it's right way up. It may mean embracing hardship and exclusion now, following the cross-shaped footsteps of our Saviour. But we embrace that and we walk that way now, knowing that one day we will rejoice and leap for a great joy, because great is our reward in heaven. The call to be apprentices of Jesus is to live for a reward not here and now, but one that is eternal. By God's grace, may we each be able to follow Jesus, to live as his faithful apprentices, knowing that the one who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. Let's pray together. Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, we come today and give thanks for your goodness to us. We give thanks for how you have blessed us individually and as a fellowship here in First Number. Father, we give thanks for the way the congregation here has been able to faithfully maintain our giving over these difficult months. Lord, as we come again to bring our offerings at the end of the service, as we put our tithes and offerings into place at the door as we leave, may we also be conscious that you call us not just to give financially to your work, but to give ourselves in daily service. Lord, in view of your great mercy to us, may we each offer our bodies to you as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to you, knowing that this is our true spiritual worship. Help us, Lord, to pursue eternal joy over temporary happiness, to live with eyes fixed on eternity with you, May that perspective help us to see that the challenges here and now are but light and momentary troubles that will be far outweighed by the weight of glory that is to come. Father, as schools get back into action this week, we pray for teachers and principals and indeed all school staff who will gather around our children to care for them. We pray for your protection on them. We pray for them as they seek to guide them through new routines and embrace what will be a very different new normal. Father, we pray for safety and protection for all in our school communities. We pray particularly for Christian staff and schools. In these challenging days, we ask that you would enable them to be salt and light, that they would have opportunities to share their hope in Jesus, and that their bright light might shine all the greater amidst such darkness. We pray as well, Father, this morning, for governors in our schools. We give thanks for the opportunity that we have in Northern Ireland where churches have so much input into the governance of our schools through the Transferers Representative Council. So Father, we pray for governors as they seek to give wise leadership and counsel. We ask that you would help them to be a strong voice for Christian values in our schools. Father, we pray for all those in our church family today who are all the way out. We pray for those who are in hospital, for those who are undergoing treatment and tests. We ask, Lord, that you would draw very near them, that they would know the peace of your presence. Father, we pray for those who continue to grieve and to mourn this morning, who feel the pain of parting and of loss, and ask that they would know your strength and peace in times of trial, that they would know your great hope. Father, we pray as well for those still not able to join us physically for worship today, for whatever reason. We ask that as they join us online, that they would know your presence, and that although we are separated by space and time, may they know that we are united in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to conclude with another song of praise. We'll remain seated again. This praise will be take by life and left me once again on the screen. Let us worship God together.
as God's servants, gifted by heaven for service in the world. May we love and serve the Lord in the strength of the Spirit. May the peace of Christ be with you. May the strong arms of God sustain you, and the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen you in every way. Amen. As I said at the start, I'd ask that you just wait in your seat um, until the steward in the case you believe when I come to the gallery first and then downstairs just to ensure that there isn't a bottleneck and thank you for your patience with us and this.